<laughs> it's really cool listening to these with you because I can hear you yes. in all yeah. of these. Musicians react. Welcome back to Professional Musicians React. We have one of my favorite people, artists, drummers, Lewis Cole with us today. This is Lewis Cole. He's a multi-instrumentalist, one of the best drummers on the planet. He's in the band Nowhere. He's a solo artist. He has five amazing albums out and he's one of my best friends. We're gonna be talking about five of Lewis's favorite, most influential drummers, Buddy Rich, Jack Dijonet, Tony Williams, Nate Wood, and Keith Carlock. We're gonna jump straight in with a clip from Buddy Rich, the monster. This is the drum solo. This is like fucking Civil War films. What? So wait, yeah. So, <laughs> Civil War films. <laughs> so tell, what, what, tell us about that. Why do you like that so much? I just think that it's really grooving. It's like a unstoppable groove. The word I wrote down is relentless. Yeah. yeah. It's like it's coming at you at a thousand miles an hour and nothing can stop it. Right. Yeah. It's like Muhammad Ali just pummeling someone in the corner of a boxing ring. How does he do that? It's Great the ride symbol, analogy. right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Is it the ride symbol that makes it feel like that? Just the Yeah, it's it's everything. I mean, he's doing the He's going that constantly with the bass drum and then he's also got like ghost notes going here the whole time. And then he's got these going in between all the cracks like and doing little like funky little ghost notes. Train rhythms. Ghost notes. Yeah. Exactly right. It's got that going the whole time, but it's like kind of subtle and it's like a you know old recording, so you don't have a lot of that annoying treble. It's just like right. pure groove frequencies. And then just, that on all four. Yeah. No, but he's got this. It's just like every limb can is we, just. Wait, wait, do can, it all together. Can, can you do it all together? I'll come try, on, yeah. come on, come on. Yeah, pump me up, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then he does some and, Civil and War films. What he's yeah. doing is like the accents are on the ants. Like all of the gut, 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 yeah, exactly. on the snares and, and the kicks. He's yeah. hitting the emphasis on those ants and it makes it just feel like you're falling down, like you're you're falling over. You know, it's never he's never hitting the one. So one. so just to zoom out, what makes Buddy Rich special? For me, it's just I mean, he's, yeah, you could talk about him being an innovator. I mean, he's one of the, like, the, you always hear about him, like, the fastest drummer is one-hand roll. I don't know, he had, like, a one-hand roll, apparently. I'm not so much, like, so pumped on the total speed blasts, which are cool. But I'm just so into the funkiness of it. Yeah. It's so grooving to me that uh, nobody else uh, has that groove. It's like funky big band drumming. Exactly, it's some of the really most funky feel. drumming I've ever heard in my life. Mm -hmm. And that's why I like it so much. How does he get that feel? Can you emulate that feel? Like if you- <laughs> Apparently <laughs> not. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks but for like, joining us today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got, we got Lewis with us. Yeah. <laughs> like what kind of beat would Buddy Rich play on like uh, on, a, on a big band tune that's funky? Like you said, it's funky big band drumming. Like what does that mean? Well, that, that would be it. Okay. Th okay. To me, that would be it. There's more examples of that. It's usually when he, I mean, his thing is swing. I mean, later on in the seventies, he's doing like some maybe like halfway kind of like boogaloo funk beat. And it's like, it's good, but this is really where the groove is for me. It's just when he's playing a swing beat, but it's just like, <laughs> you know, and it's just like, is it? I can't not love that. Is it the way, okay, so Lewis, Lewis Cole swing is like Sibelius, like 97% swing, uh -huh. right? <laughs> you do it the swing slider? Yeah, the swing slider. <laughs> like the spacing between eighth notes? Yeah. 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 What's Buddy Rich's? 69. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> so I don't know, probably, it's not a hundred. Right, but he has kind of like an iconic. Yeah, it's not like, feels. it's not super straightened out. It's like, right. and it's not it's like a cell phone calling and you have an amp next right. to it. Yeah, it doesn't feel metronomic. It doesn't feel, I mean, he, he's got amazing time, How but it doesn't feel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It doesn't yeah. feel, it doesn't feel yeah. like that. No, it's a, it's a human being straight up three-dimensional meat suit, just <laughs> just really killing it. But like very solid time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, should we go to the next, next go clip. to the next clip? Let's do it. Okay, this yeah. is Jack DeJanette playing with Miles Davis. The song's called Willie Nelson Remake Take Two. Here we go. Yeah. 
What do you love about that? All right, Jack DeJunet's probably like, overall in my life, maybe my favorite drummer, just because like his groove is very not quantized or yes. very not grid, you know, it's just like, Yes. I'm not going to use words, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like the, the blow up things outside of a car dealership. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, too. He's so, he's so like sloshy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's just like his, his grid, instead of it being like, it's like, you know, yeah, and it's yeah. just, but it feels so good. It's yeah. like, it still has this just like meditative. Yeah, so it's meditative, organic, soupy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It's got this. It's got this meditative, um, which is not how. It's so funny that he's one of your favorite drummers because that's. I don't think of you as soupy. You are locked oh, yeah. into I, the grid. Why? Well, you should listen to me in high school. I sounded exactly like Jack Dejanet. I was just trying to rip him off every day of my life uh, that I practiced, and uh, I used to play like that. It's like can, you know? can you play like that now? Or is I don't even know if I could. I mean, I, I can't. Wow. Do it. But that's that's more like Jack DeJunet than it is like Lewis Cole. I think that was a good imitation. Yeah, that's more like what I sounded like when I was like 18 or something. Yeah. Just and like, how would you play that beat now? A little more like, uh, you know, like yeah, vacuum locking. sealed. Right, vacuum sealed. Because that's what works more for what I'm writing now, I guess. That's why I kind of, I wanted to like straighten out my grid at one point, you know, and I had to get away from trying to play like that. When you hear this record and these like drum tones, because mm -hmm. I also, those tones are different than Lewis Cole drum tones. Yeah. I feel like your drums sound different. Yeah. I guess where do your drums, what, who are your drum sound influences? Forget about groove for a second. Whose drums sound the way you want your drums to sound or, or who's influenced The you biggest are? one that it started with was uh, Jim Black and he used to, he would detune his bass drum like almost all the way and it would growl when you'd hit it, it'd be like when he'd hit yeah. it, it was really cool. So I was like, I need to do that. And You do an 18, is it 18 with a, with a super detuned, like yeah. floppy? 18 or 20 sometimes, yeah. But is the back head detuned and no, or the no, front head is detuned and then no back head, right? This head is detuned it's, it's tuned up like medium kind of, and then I detuned two of the bolts all the way. And wait. then this side is detuned entirely. Okay, wait, let's have you play the same beat twice. The first time, let's leave the kit exactly as is. Second time, let's have you detune the kick so it sounds more Lewis-y, and then we'll play the beats right back to back to each other and we can hear it uh, as you intend your kit to sound. Now, now get do my your key. shit. Yeah, get your key. Get right. your key. And we'll wait here. A good idea. Yeah. I'm detuning this uh, resonant head basically all the way. These are like literally, you can move these. The thing is, is that if there was like a real thin head on this, you would really hear the difference. This is a little thicker, so it's not going to be a massive difference. What okay. would you do to the snare? I put a little symbol on it. I wonder if we can. Or a little piece of metal. You have a little snack tray of metal? Okay, that's, <laughs> that's perfect. Let's hear that same beat now. You play your kick louder than most people play their kick. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And your snares, you get the, the back beats, you play loud. Yeah. Which makes the ghost notes kind of more effective, ghost notey. Right, because there's a dynamic a bigger range disparity. Between. Yeah. I also feel like your 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 kicks are heavy, but it's almost like every kick is the same volume. So it's like a sampled kick drum. That's and big. So instead of bump bump cat bump bump cat bump bump, it's bump 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 cat bump 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 cat yeah. bump bump bump. Every kick is like a punch in the face. Yeah, that's the thing, and it's like you think like. And I, I could be playing louder is the thing, because you think like, oh, I want heavy bass drum, and I'm just like, you know. But that's true. If you play it a little softer so that the loud ones are kind of the same volume as the softer ones, and they're kind of like similar volume, it just sounds way more powerful, especially on recordings. Can we hear your that, that same beat again? And let's play it, let's with the, with, let's just, just listen to the kick as you play it. It is such a Lewis Cole sound. It's funny, like you have one of the most definitive, clear voices out of any drummer I've ever worked with. Oh, when you sit down on a kit, it could be any kit in the world, and I know that's Lewis Cole playing. 
Wow. We so we lived together in college, full disclosure. And Lewis, you had a toy kit in our apartment. Yeah. That you got from the internet or something. Where where did you get that kit? Yeah, from eBay. It was from eBay. It was a children's drum set. <laughs> And that to me is your sound. You always <laughs> just sound like you're play, like you're playing yeah. on a children's. That's drum a good set. sign. Let's yeah. listen to Tony Wilmans. Tony Williams. <laughs> to Wilmans. Who's that? Yeah. Tony Wilmans. <laughs> Tony Williamton. The great yeah. British drummer Tony Willington. <laughs> all right. Fuck you all. Here we go. This is Tony Williams. To whom it may concern them. Fuck. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's really cool listening to these with you because I can hear you yes. in all yeah. of these motherfuckers. Yes. The common thread is an element of like unhinged, unleashed, chaotic insanity. Yeah, blasts. That is blasts. Yeah. It's just like energy level 11 out of 10. Yeah. Straight <laughs> thunderbolt to your, to your yeah, heart. It's, exactly. Yeah. And that is like your playing. Thanks. Yeah. What makes Tony... Williams, Tony Williams. Yeah, definitely the 11 out of 10 <laughs> relentless energy. He was like a child prodigy, right? Like he yeah, for sure. Like with Miles Davis. Yeah, he was like 17 or maybe younger. Don't quote me on that. I don't remember the age, but he was really young. Yeah. And he would be like going up, I think this is what I heard, uh, going up to the bandstand and be like, yo, let me play with you to Miles Davis. And Miles was like, who the hell is this teenager? You know? <laughs> and um, then he played and it was like, wow, this is the greatest drumming <laughs> ever. You know, so that, yeah, that's pretty legendary. Where does he sit on the Dijonette, like loose, loose to swashy to like metronomic spectrum? He's definitely a little more uh, reined in grid wise. I would say it's a little more even grid, but even st still, yeah, I mean, he has some, some wave in there and some, some flop, which I really love, but it's his own particular kind. And so he kind of like, he was on the train with Miles Davis kind of pushing the envelope from more straight ahead into like the 70s and yeah. the 80s. Yeah, I've, I've actually heard, because I did like a, I had to do a paper when I was in music school about like Tony Williams. And I remember like reading on the internet that um, he was the actually the guy kind of pushing for like the 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 move into the, like the rock world from like the strictly jazz cool. world into the rock world. He was like, I love the Beatles and I love, uh, you know, electric guitar and all this stuff. I'm pretty sure like he was the guy kind of pushing at first, in a lot of ways. Louis, when you listen to this, when you listen to this music in high school and college and, you know, when you were in music school, et cetera, did you, did you like put it on headphones and play along with it? Or like, how did you let it influence you? Yeah, at first I would just listen to it. Like I listened to this album and then the album before, uh, Tony Williams, his own, you know, project. And I would just be like, I would put it on and I'd be like, what is happening? I had no idea how to play any of that. And I was just like, but I love it. And I need to <laughs> how fuse this to my out? soul. Yeah, how did you figure it out? I, I just enough listening to it. And I was like, wait, he's doing a, you know, the whole time. Did you ever slow stuff down? No. Okay, so you just listen to it and try to isolate what you're hearing. Okay, the hat's doing this, the kick is doing this, the ghost notes are this. Exactly. Yeah, just like listening and listening and listening. I just love the music so much. I know the music's insane, but I loved it. It's like still my favorite, some of my favorite music. So I would just be constantly, you know, putting that through my ears and then so. And how long would you play along with a track like that when you were practicing? Uh, I didn't really start like seriously practicing probably till like, I was like 19 or 20, and I remember practicing like two hours a day, but I don't know how much of it would be that. Maybe, I don't know, like 30 minutes or something. I got tinnitus, so. Yeah, enough to fucking yeah. <laughs> Enough to when shred you, my cilia. Yeah. When you're when you're learning something new, or when you used to learn new stuff, mm. do you start slow? Do you like play beats slow and then speed them up? Yes. You would start getting the coordination together and then speed it up. Definitely. How much did you practice with a metronome? Oh man. Not enough. I mean, my drum teacher was like, you got to practice with the metronome. And then I'd be like, yeah, totally. And then he would go and then I would just, you know, do it without the metronome. And it's, you know, I kind of regret that actually. I wish I did more. I used to walk around with a metronome when I was like, okay, my metronomic time sucks. I need to fix it. So I used to like, I like overcompensated and I would like walk around with a metronome and I would like sleep with a metronome under my pillow. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like a nutcase. You slept with a ticking metronome under your pillow. Yeah. For how long? <laughs> this was probably like six months. 
six months yeah. with a metronome under your pillow. I'm not Check saying it. it worked, but <laughs> <laughs> I think I it's it. <laughs> I mean, you also used to, you'd go to the practice rooms with your laptop yeah. and you'd record yourself for hours and then you'd listen to yourself for hours. Yeah, that's true. That was very painful. That's maybe my least favorite thing. That's so tough to do. I hated it's like, that. When you would look at your drums on a grid, because I'm, I'm trying to imagine how you got to where you are in terms of ability to play on tempo and on metronome and on grid. When you um, would play in a in a, a Pro Tool session or, or whatever, Garage Band or whatever, would you zoom in and look at where your individual oh, yeah. hits at were on the grid? Dude, we used to record tracks like video songs together and we would do that with you like this doesn't feel as good let's zoom in and see why and that actually was big for me i was like whoa you can do that i think you were the first guy to show me that you could zoom in on pro tools and be like here's how you suck <laughs> it's proven <laughs> <laughs> you know and then i was like damn that's actually kind of helpful it's like now i know that i'm when i do that i tend to be behind or ahead or something do you ever worry because one thing we we've talked about before on the show is overcompensating for the grid instead of letting your time be your time and you're so focused on the grid, are you not worried about adding a, whatever, more human feel to your playing? Or do you want it to be, you know, right on the on the ticks? Yeah, the thing is, is like the, the music I started writing ended up being so grid oriented that I was like, I need to be able to play like this all the time, you know, and, and really nail that. So there are certain situations now where it's like, I don't want to play like that. And sometimes it's actually hard to like get into that like looser mindset. But it's like, yeah, sometimes I will want it to be like a real squishy, weird beat that's like not tied to any kind of grid or metronome or anything like that. I remember asking you once, like, is perfect time funky? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you, do you remember what you said? I probably was like, no, I was probably some like, yes, yeah, snot headed. No, you said, yes, go listen to Keith Carlock. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. Because <laughs> he's, he's so metronomic and exact and funky. Yeah. But you can kind of, but then there's the other end of the spectrum. It's like Dijonette is like nowhere near a grid. Right. And he's funky as hell. Yeah, it's like, you, which one's more grooving? You can't so say. What makes something funky? It's a right away guttural reaction like that. It I don't is know. or it isn't. It is or it isn't. And it's a feel thing. It just feels funky. Yeah, and a lot of times it, it, you, you, you know, Thankfully, a lot of people are in touch, have that sense, and they can kind of sense like if something is or isn't. But it's not like you have a special ability. Is it, is it kind of like when I when we were listening to that Dijonette thing? A drummer will kind of make their own grit. You know what I mean? Like he's kind of playing against himself. Mm -hmm. And is it maybe that interaction, like between all of his limbs, like he's kind of creating a grid like with his hat and then playing against it mm -hmm. with the other stuff and that interaction is kind of like what makes it, what provides like the thing to push against. A lot of drumming I find is like what feels comfortable in your body. Like I had to practice so many hours just to be like, what makes sense for my like octopus legs? You know, it's like, <laughs> and I play open hand, I play incorrectly. You know, it's like I had to figure that out. So it's a lot of the feel has to do with like what just like lays well with like the weight of your body and the length of your limbs and all oh, that stuff. That's such a good point. It's all weird like anatomical yeah. information and it, I don't know. I don't understand it. I just like it. I just know that that is an important part of the drums. During the pandemic, I went on a deep dive in just how people hold picks. Right. And I did like hours and hours of just like finding videos of my favorite guitar players and trying to see how they were holding the pick because there's so many different ways to hold a pick and then trying to see which way worked best for me and everybody's i feel like it's kind of that process on every instrument where it's like okay what do other people do what just feels right for my body you know what i mean there's no right way yeah what works for Dijonette's not going to work for you because you're you have different proportions. Yeah, exactly. I want to zoom in on that with Lewis's hi-hat work and how you hold your hi-hat stick. Because your hi-hat work is insane. Oh, thanks. You play hi-hat faster than I, almost anybody, I think, in the world, probably. Oh, I don't know. I mean... Let's it, not make these claims on a legit professional podcast. 
<laughs> just gonna ask you to blow our minds for a second. Can sure. you play like a super drum and bassy, like, fast hi hat, last beat, fast hi hat? You want to do this crap? Yeah, yeah, do, do that crap. And then I want to see how you're like, holding your stick. No, maybe not the double one because okay. that's, but but like it's a cheating. single, cheating. single hi hat. Well, it's not cheating. You should do that too. You but see I want to do it with a pen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, let's see single hi hat, like fast drum and bass blast. And then I want to isolate the hi hat and just see how you're holding your stick and how you're playing it. That's insane. And your your snare hat, your snare hand is moving so fast too. It's playing like upbeats and ghost Have notes. Have people and stuff. been doing the double thing like forever? Is that like a thing that's just been around? Or is somebody like popular? I actually came I uh, I'm the inventor of the no, I, I I actually did come up with it on accident by myself before I saw like infinity people on YouTube doing it. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I didn't. You stumbled it. upon it. Yeah, but I came up with it, you know, without seeing it. Independent it like, invention. Yeah, like my technique was so bad. I was just like, I was playing, and then I was like, my arms tired. I'm gonna play on this side, and then the stick started going like this, and then I started doing that. And I was like, wait a minute, this is, this is amazing. Yeah. I'm the best ever. Yeah. <laughs> I just invented a new way of playing drums. <laughs> yeah. I'm a genius. I know the thing you're talking about, which is the. Uh, that yeah, like yeah. Um, what is happening in your with your pinky there? What is going on? Well, is it flying out? No, it doesn't okay. look like it's it. not supposed to. Okay. That's, that's considered bad technique. Okay. Yeah, there's a there's a beat on that song called "I Love Lewis Cole" by Thundercat, and the beat that I do has that. It's like. Yeah, so it's like. Can you isolate your left. It's like turbo horse. <laughs> turbo horse. <laughs> turbo horse. Wait, let's PCT listen to Knee Body. Let's okay. listen to Knee Body. Uh, this is Nate Wood, Nerd Mountain. Here we go. That track is the closest person to Lewis Cole that I've heard who is not Lewis Cole. Yeah. It's the kick drum volume. Yeah. yeah. Like, who is Nate influenced by? Same people that I'm influenced Jim by. Black? That, it's not why I sound like him. I sound like him because I'm trying to rip off Nate Wood. Yeah. He loves Jack DeJohnette. He loves Tony Williams. I don't know if this is right, but what Nate Wood sounds like to me is there's like a lot of real low lows and a lot of real high highs. It's mm -hmm. not like a mid rangey drum sound yeah. where everything's just kind of melts together. Mm -hmm. It's like wide spectrum. Yeah. Each drum sounds very separate to me, unlike other drummers where it kind of sounds like one instrument this is like there's a kick drum blasting your face off there's the snare drum blasting your face off so yeah. this very distinct like matt chamberlain to me sounds like gushy oh, all melted together where it's like you yeah. can't tell what's a ghost note on a snare versus a hi-hat mm -hmm. you know what i mean like all the drums just kind of like and yeah. nate wood is like jagged edges like hard lines louis yeah. can we hear you play this knee body Beat or something <laughs> oh my like God, it. This is a bad idea. <laughs> what do you got, Lily? Oh, you hear these things hitting at the same time, which gives it that machine gun. Yeah, exactly. Of and this is like sometimes filling it in. Wow, are you so you're 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 doubling this cymbal hand with the kick most of the time? Yeah. Can you play just these together? And do that, do the kick pattern without the hand now, so we can hear what the kick sounds like. And now with this. Out of the hat. Oh, it's so cool. Yeah. yeah, you can do cool stuff like that. It's like pretty machiny. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Last one. Keith Carlock appearance uh, with Wayne Krantz and Tim LaFay. So this is just like a live clip. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Damn. He is angry. Yeah. He so knows how to project pure energy. Yeah. It's amazing. When you record drums, are you recording that loud when you're recording for I, your records? I try not to personally. Why? I don't sound as good 
if I hit that hard. How hard do you record when you're recording drums for beats? Like probably what I was tunes? probably what I was playing before. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. The other thing I noticed about that recording is he is. You mentioned like anatomical, you know, being in your body and like the position of your limbs and the size and shape of your arms and all that kind of stuff. He's yeah. flailing around like an octopus. Yes. When you play drums, one of the character things about you is you play drums like this. <laughs> yeah. Like you're like nothing. You're so yeah. stoic. You're an emotionless machine. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> there are these. I'm there, dead inside. Yeah. <laughs> there, there are these Instagram clips that you know that that you put up where you got the waffle around your your neck. Yeah. And you're you're just you're <laughs> yeah. still. But the beats are in fucking sane. So I guess, do you ever, is that a choice? Do you just, you don't feel it like he feels it in his full body or how come How much still? of it is the waffle and how much of it is you? Yeah, it's all waffle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, dude, I tried to play like that. I used to be like, damn, that looks cool. Like Keith Carlock and Brian Blade, they're like, you know, they're like fucking, even anytime he does that, like, I can't do that with my, I literally can't do that. I will, I just, I'll shred my arms. I can't do it. I don't know why. It just doesn't work for my body. So for some reason I end up being like a mannequin torso. And it's all in like the forearms. You know? Do you get tired physically when you're drumming? Oh yeah. So, so even though you're not really moving that much, it still takes a lot out of you physically. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons I have to play like that because like, I'm just my, I'm not designed to play drums. I don't think like, Anatomically, it's it's just been weird. I have weird challenges, and uh, so yeah. There's a bunch of people on the internet that would disagree. <laughs> I feel like you were made to play drums. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think in my brain I was. It's just having long limbs. It's like, it's weird, man. It's just a different. I mean, Keith Carlock is tall, but his his center of gravity is different than mine. He's just yeah. a different build than me, and I just couldn't really do what he's doing just physically. I mean, just playing wise, but also physically. I mean, it's just like it, I can't do that. I don't think. Yeah. Just, I've just had to come up with a technique that works for me, which ends up being like a octopus, kind of loose forearm octopus. Yeah. Yeah. Spill the beans. Question for you: the live set recordings, mm -hmm. which are epically fucking good. I listen to those records. It probably there. I I think I listen to them maybe more than most of like repeat listens. I just oh, I listen wow. to them all the time. I love them so much. Thanks. Did you do any scooching? Do you do scooching in post production, or are are those live takes completely? And maybe not those records in particular. Yeah. Your recordings in general. I know you do a lot of live synth work. Even the stuff that sounds like it's programmed in as that's MIDI notes is actually you playing it. Yeah. Do you do scooching in post production, or is it mostly live tape? Let's say when you're recording music, you accidentally play something that's out of time, out of sync with everything else. What you can do is literally take that one section and scooch it over so everything's in sync. This is wonderful technology of music editing software. Previously, we couldn't do this. You'd have to go in on like tape and literally like cut out these little segments and move it over where. Now you just gotta click a button, scooch, and you're good. I mean, I try to avoid it because that is, you can kind of ruin the human feel. You know, if, if there is like a, you know, a moment where it's like everything was perfect, but then like you just like, your stick is sweaty or I don't know, like somebody else like just has a, a freak out, you know? <laughs> and there's like one, you know, one thing here or there that that is off, then I'll be like, let's scoot that because it's just like, it takes you out of it, you know? But I really, I try to avoid that because it does kind of ding up the, the human feel of it. What I do is I try to do a lot of takes and sometimes we'll cut in between takes. How many takes do you do? However many it takes, sometimes uh, nine or 10. Like after we know the song and have rehearsed it, like. Together, you're talking specifically about the live sessions. Yes. All together, you'll do nine or 10. Yes. And then you'll cut like, okay, let's use the first half of take four exactly. and the second half of take five. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do that. But it's, I don't, I don't try to like, it's like we've, we've spent so much time trying to get like the best people to play, you know, rhythms together. And we try to get the best situation where like vacuum packed into a hallway where we can really hear each other or something like that. And it's like, let's try to like really do it, you know, and try not to like, uh, you know, post-production it too much to the right. point where it kind of loses its... Right. Charm. So we have... Because if you listen to those things, like, we're... It does speed up and slow down 
in Mark, you can hear it. Yeah. Yeah. So just to bring it back to Keith Carlisle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What sets him apart? What's his sort of like distinctive thing or innovation? To me, he has some of the vibe of my favorite drummers like Tony Williams and Jack DeJohnette, but he kind of did his own thing with it. And uh, he's got a really strong grid. And uh, is his? I don't know. It's just his feel. It just it, it, whenever I hear him play, it just like it just takes over, and I, I just I feel. Uh, I don't know, soothed or fired up or yeah, puffed yeah, yeah. with it at the same time. Is his sound, like the sound of his drums, to me, it sounds more normal. Uh -huh. Like it sounds like he's playing more of like a standard kit with like standard drum sounds. Is yeah, I think he has very open tunings, but it's not like he's not doing a bunch of metal weird additions, you know? Yeah. He's, uh, he's got like an open bass drum, open toms, open snare drum for the most part, and just big old cymbals. Okay, what's a song you've been listening to recently. Kyrie by Mozart. Those guidelines that yeah. he follows rigidly, yes. I feel like that's kind of what makes this song. It's just like, it's perfect. The melody, the counter melodies, the bass movement, the chordal movement, mm. it's just like, yeah. this is perfect. Yeah. I know that's funny to say about music, but it's, it's perfect. It's music of the spheres. Jack, what do you got? Jake Sherman. Let's be friends. Let's be friends. It's got kind of a Brian Wilson crazy weird thing going. It keeps changing keys and just lifting and getting lost and reverby and wild. Yeah. And uh, I just think it's such a cool composition. Yeah, Jake Sherman is great. So great. I like that guy. He's yeah. also a great guy. Yeah. Have you hung out with him? Yeah. Yeah, he's great. Uh, what do you got, Ryan? Salute the institution, Simon Dawes. Salute the institution. Simon Dawes, so this is before what's now Dawes, which is Taylor Goldsmith's middle name. He and Blake had this band, Simon Dawes. Simon is Blake's middle name. And on this record, uh, I think it's called Carnivore, is where Blake and uh, Blake met Tony. Blake, Sean Everett engineered it. I think he might have mixed it. Um, and uh, and it's one of my favorite records, this song, Salute the Institution. Oh, and Lewis. Would you would you sign Wall Simon? Yeah, sure. The Red Diamond, Wall Simon. Yeah. Wall Simon, the Red Diamond. We we started this tradition. That's pretty bad taste in the center, right? Not no no no. Do it. You deserve the center. Think of Very yourself. few people. I mean, I am probably the coolest guy. In the we got. <laughs> we, oh yes. Oh, doing outline fonts. Yes. Yeah, you like that? Yeah, I like this that. This is actually my signature. It's horrible. Is that what you write on your checks? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is uh... beautiful. Thank you, Louie. Great to have you. Thank you, everybody, Thanks. for watching. Uh, if you like this, make sure to uh, subscribe and leave a comment. Tell us what we should listen to and talk about next. And we will see you next week on Professional Musicians React. See you next week.